Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyclocross Social Podcast. Cross is finally here. Maybe not in Belgium, but racing returns to our screens this weekend with the USCX Series. And with me here to take a look ahead at the USCX Series, American Cyclocross, Cyclocross in general, is Issam. Thank you for being here, Issam. Yes, thank you for having me again. My CX fever is running pretty high already, so I'm really looking forward to getting going. But the season is already underway. On the podcast, you could have heard about the Australian and New Zealand national championships. But we have been racing in Europe for two weekends. We have had the Hope Supercross series. We had two victories for Thomas Mean and Anna Kay in that series. But racing also got underway on the European mainland this weekend. We raced in Lützelbach. We had a win for Loris Roulier there. Second place was for Wart Huips. Jens Decker ended third at his comeback. A day later, we raced in Bensheim. Stan Gaudry took the win ahead of Wart Huips and Loris Roulier. There was also racing for women in Germany, of course. Thankfully, we had the period that they didn't need to organize races for women. We had two wins for Marie Schreiber during the weekend. And she was joined on the podium by Annick van Alphen and Christina Zemanova and Lützelbach. A day later, Zemanova ended second and van Alphen ended third in Bensheim. But now we are finally getting to the televised season, Isam. And it feels super weird that we are here in mid-September talking about the start of the televised season. It's not that long ago that we had the first races of the season, at least in Belgium, taking place in the end of August, or at least had the Exact Cross series taking place now, but everything seems way more backloaded in the Christmas period this year, which is a trend which started last year, but it definitely feels weird, because normally we would have already watched a couple of crosses. Yeah, I have to agree, because it's um, normally we kind of roll into the Exact Crosses, and then, yeah, we kind of... um, then we have the first World Cup, and from there we start the season. But now it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's a bit weird because also the Belgian media is not really picking up on anything cyclocross related. For us, it's a little bit, I wouldn't say the main source, but definitely it's one of the most you know important sources in terms of uh, news and, and info. So yeah, I'm I'm to be honest, I'm still you know while I'm definitely looking forward to the season. You know, there's also the Vuelta going on and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, you're also looking at that and, you know, I still have to get into it. But I think with the first race back on um, on the screen, it will definitely uh, come back uh, fully and then we will, uh, you know, prolong with the season. It's a combination of circumstances because if you look at the four pre-season races we have had, or maybe it's five from the Exact Cross series, we had... Lokere, which was normally the opener, said they couldn't organize because they had Belgian championships earlier this year. Kruibeke, they had roadworks. We have Meulebeke organizing the Belgian championships. Beringe is still there, but it moved later, which is understandable because there would be a standalone race. And then we had Bredene, but that got scrapped last year because of disappointing start field. Grote prijs Paul Herreigers didn't come back this year i don't think it will come back in the future but it leaves us in a bit of a vacuum here and it's just weird because normally we have Iserbeet against van Turenhout, against zweig van der haar nieuwe huis and now there's none of it because everything is just in the christmas period it's busier than ever we have like 11 races in two weeks or something it's it's crazy it's getting out of hand it's not healthy for the riders and it's a trend that's been going on post covid where the big races want the big names so the rest of the season kind of just is forgotten about yeah true you know that i think there are certain factors that play a role in this obviously the ones that you already have mentioned i think it also has to do maybe with a lot of the riders that have a a more intense road program or do mountain bike next to it or you know the riders also sometimes need to take a little more rest the interest of of those races also kind of declines and you know we're heading towards some sort of a um you know that that the interest of of the cyclocross season lays more in november and then going into december as well which is you know year by year getting fuller and fuller and 
it's also getting you know it's getting a bit crazy in in in, in that period and while there is a lot of room right now in 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 September and October as well uh, it seems like you know the Belgian organizers you know are not very interested in it, in it because of the profit that they um, that they could gain in other months in the months a little bit later in November and in December it's not great uh, but i but i can understand obviously the organizers for for doing it in such a way i think there has to be looked at in 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 this scenario because i think that there are definitely some riders that would love to start the season a little bit earlier and don't really have the opportunity or have to go you know to either smaller races elsewhere or go to the to the states and and do the uscx series there so yeah it's 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 a uh, it's a bit double and, and and also difficult for some of the riders. It's especially difficult for the full time cross riders. It should be an absolute priority to keep riders like Isabiet van der Haar, Nieuwe Huis, uh, younger riders like uh, Joran Visure, Wietse Meuse. These riders need to be able to earn a living in cross. We can't completely reform the sport simply because a few of the best guys appear to be road riders and it's a bigger question of where does cross fit in a changing cycling landscape gravel is a rising discipline road is becoming more important because cross riders figure out that they can do well there others are pretty good on the mountain bike there needs to be a way to fit everything together and that's difficult because We can see that the Mountain Bike World Cup is expanding. They are having their final round now. It pushes the cross season into a smaller scene or operating window. It's difficult. And at the end of the day, the fact you raise or the point you raise about the commercial aspect of race organizers is completely true. If you can organize a race now, if you're mole, or you can organize it in the Christmas period, and in the Christmas period, people will turn up. You can throw the bag then against about that much their agents, like 10,000 euros to 15,000 euros if you come to the start line. Okay, well, we'll come. Well, that happens, and then what happens to the spectator numbers? They rise. But it's still a difficult position because those commercial aspects are taking over from the interest of the riders. That we have so many races in the Christmas period is not good for the riders. It's too tiring for them. And... When I see that the World Cup was having this big story about every Sunday World Cup, it needs to be recognizable that they are having races in the Christmas period, three of them in one week, then finishing it off with Zonhove. All those three races in the Christmas period are not on Sundays. There's two on a Saturday because they don't want to be on Christmas Eve and they don't want to be on New Year's Eve. They also want to be on Boxing Day. That's just purely commercial. They saw how much money those races made last year. There's a reason why the Belgian races are crammed up in the back of the season. There's a reason why Dublin, Flamanville, Troy get the shittier dates. There's a reason why there's an empty gap the week after Waterloo. The World Cup just wants in on that bag. And from their perspective, I can see why. But from a rider's perspective, I'm just worried that they're going to be drained and it's going to be too much and we're just going to see riders be absolutely burned out towards the end of the christmas period yeah it will it will be very difficult for for in the next coming years if they would continue in this trajectory and for these type of riders that you know mainly earn their money with with cyclocross um but i think that it's like it's difficult for for some of the races to you know, make a decision in earning, I don't know what the percentage would be, but just let's say you earn 50% less, but you're earlier in the season, or you try to find a place around November, December, January, and hope that you actually can fit in somewhere there and, you know, earn earn 50% more. You know, it's, um, it is a decision that, that the, whole, the circumstances led to, and, you know, they're, they have to look into it how they could help some races to actually organize a little bit earlier um, and actually see a benefit in doing so. Because, you know, at, at, it is also, in a way, it's not really fair for some of the races or, you know, they need to lower the expectations maybe. But if, if a race organizes in, in September, we have seen, you know, that the people that show up are not a lot. The, I think that the tendency for, for those races 
are not amazing in terms of spectators as well. So, you know, it is it is very difficult, I think, for the organizers. But it is definitely an issue where where what they need to look into because it's if it continues like this, it's definitely not beneficial for the riders that are you know, I would say purely focused on 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 the cyclocross and earn a living out of it because you know when the the big guys show up in a way you know they don't really have a lot of races that that are televised that have a lot of attention where they cannot really get that podium or can get that you know top five or something so it's definitely not great that it's happening right now at the moment in cyclocross scene and hopefully it, 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 it can be changed but you know i i don't really know how that is actually possible because you know at this moment this is how the scene is and you know just at the moment, you just have to deal with it, I guess. Um, but hopefully, maybe something from the UCI, some regulation can help this uh, situation sort out. I don't know if the UCI is the one responsible here. I mean, I know you lifted the idea once of maybe having a maximum number of races for a series in a month, but then the complications for other classifications outside of Belgium are a bit unknown. But good communication between race organizers is key. The World Cup should 100% communicate when they are starting because I believe that the USCX series was planning to fit in the third round next week as Waterloo like they've done the past couple of years. They need to communicate these things with each other and I would love there to be like a central race organizers meeting or some calendar discussion or at least in Belgium. But that's difficult. The relationship between Flanders Classics and Colazzo is good. It's never really been good when Flanders Classics got the World Cup. It's not becoming better with Colazzo feeling that the Super Prestige is getting the good dates next to the Belgian World Cups and that they are left out to double with races such as Dublin, Essen and their exact cross series is doubling with Faldi Sol. They definitely feel left out. So my hopes are low, but it would be good to see things go better but let's go about the things that are going good uscx series into its third season live on gcn again four rounds same as last year we are opening in Roanoke, virginia then next week we are going to new york state to rochester for the third and fourth round then we are on to maryland baltimore to be precise for the third round then a week of nothing then waterloo then King CX not in the US CX series, and then the series finishes in Falmouth, Massachusetts. So, Isam, you already briefly mentioned it, but how are you feeling towards the start of the cyclocross season? Yeah, I like I like the racing. To be honest, it's um, from time to time very close racing as well. It is a bit different, I would say, compared to to what you have in Europe. But it's it's definitely exciting, and um, I think um yeah I look forward to the racing, and I definitely think that that will help me to uh, to fully get myself into the cyclocross modus in a way. Evening racing is super chill. I love to crack open a nice drink at the end of a productive or a <laughs> sometimes less productive day. But this weekend it will be productive visiting the Kleberg Cross and doing uni work. Final year of my bachelor. Now watching the USCX series. So let's go over some of the competitors. Mr. USCX series himself, Vincent Bastans, is racing once again. But there's a couple of other Europeans following him this year. Anton Ferdinand from the Hens Maas team is coming. Loris Rouillet is coming. And then, of course, the American champion is there. Curtis White racing in the Stars and Stripe will be interesting to see how they will fare. What do you expect this on? Because last year we had some pretty good racing as Bastans seemed to be on the decline from the season before, whereas Curtis White had one of his stronger seasons. Yeah, indeed. I think that Curtis White is definitely going to the, to be the one bringing up the fight to, to the European guys. Bastans, Bastins, you know, that's uh, obviously, obviously going to be the guy probably with with the most experience in these type of races. Roulier has been has been going well. Also at the start of this season has been going quite well, so I think that you know for him it's um, it's going to be interesting what he can do in, in, in these type of races and you know the fun part about these type of races most of the time it's not a it's not as straightforward as you would think. There is most of the time these guys are not really racing for the win. At least some of them and then now you actually have to race for the win. So the strategy is a bit different for some of the riders. And, 
you know it always it always brings the best out of it so it's um it's going to be very exciting to to see what 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 really will unfold in uh, in these races yeah in the absence of eric brunner or brunner i've heard both pronunciations not entirely sure which one to use he's well, been doing gravel quite a bit. We know last year he hit a wall towards the end of the season and is maybe taking a different approach. He's not entered for any of the USCX series races, but in his absence, I would mainly expect a fight between Bastans and White. Although White normally struggles a bit on the faster courses, that could give Loris Roulier a chance. As you said, Isami has been going well. His team, the Lagrange Cross team, went bankrupt. They hope to make some sort of restart with mainly Swiss riders in January, maybe as a road team, but he found a new team, the Heinzo Matrat Sport team. So good for him, he's going, doing a takeover of our Instagram story. So if you're interested to see how a European rider fares in the US culture wise, just everything, make sure to check out our stories. I would say those would be my top three riders at the moment, although Roulier is a bit inconsistent. And then I would say Ferdinand is slightly behind them. If he has a good day, he can do something. Also worth noting, Bastans is bringing a teammate, Bart Junior van de Castele. That's just torture for the American announcers to pronounce the C, which you pronounce as a K. That's going to be a pain for them. I don't expect much from him. He's a first year U23. I don't think he will do that well. His results on the road and in cross in the past have not been amazing. He will be further behind riders that I'm going to mention now. Caleb Swartz, Andrew Strohmeyer racing for the CX Hair Development Team and Michael Vandenham, the Canadian who is racing around bringing his young son with him actually in the trailer they are driving. Super fun to see. I would say those are the names I would mainly expect behind the Europeans and white. So to repeat myself... Ferdinand, yes, he will probably do well, but at the moment I would see him as a fourth guy who might challenge on his day, but overall will not reach the level of White, Rouillet and Bastans. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, but you know, you never know. It might might be his year this year. He's you know still a young guy. There is still some growth uh, that he can uh, potentially you know gain some 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 extra. Uh, points here and there where he could uh, eventually you know bring up the fight to the guys but yeah it's 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 going to be interesting I would also agree on on Bastons as well because you know he was struggling a little bit last year as well so it it almost looked like there was some sort of a decline decline starting there um, so it will be interesting to see if that decline continued or it's just um, it was just a sign that that we shouldn't have picked up and everything is going better now this season but I think that that Roulier definitely, you know, the way he was racing in Germany last year as well, made some had some good racing, and you know, despite the fact that uh, his team folded, it seemed that the that the you know his preparation for the season was uh, quite uh, quite okay. So, yeah, that's going to be interesting to see what what Roulier can do. With. To be honest, I see him as as um as a as a great contender, but of course. Uh, Curtis White is definitely also someone that um, that can win races and that can definitely use maybe a little bit of his experience in these type of races to to his advantage. Yeah, about Bastans. I mean, he had that super high in the twenty one twenty two season, and I still don't understand that he didn't get extended by Hens Mass after that. He deserved a contract. He was basically the founder of that team, but it is what it is, and I don't think he will reach that height anymore he's getting older i think it will slowly decline from here first signs we already saw last year would expect that to continue but as some stars fall others rise and i will again say i'm super excited to see what andrew strohmeyer can do he was a bit inconsistent last season but he had a couple of strong results from the top of my head he was fifth or sixth in the u23 world cup in tabor so yeah pretty Interested to see what he can do racing for the CX Harris development team. Then on to the women's racing. And let's start with the big absent rider, Clara Honsinger, the national champion, currently not entered for any of the races. We in fact don't even know if she will have a team this season. For the people who aren't fully in on it, Clara Honsinger races for the EF team. EF Education women's team was not 
affiliated with the EF Education men's team. EF Education was sponsoring two separate teams. The women's team was set up by Linda Jackson. The sub-sponsor, so the co-sponsor of that team, pooled this year, leaving that team without funding. EF couldn't do it alone. Jackson couldn't find new sponsors. EF Education then said, okay, we are not continuing sponsoring this team either. We will move and sponsor a new team. The new team they are sponsoring is set up by Jonathan Waters, the manager of the EF men's team. He wants to bring those together, have a men's and a women's team, which he owns. That team will be on the continental level. The World Tour license that EF Education currently has will not be transported. Staff will not be brought in from one team to the other either. It's really a new team with the same name. They're bringing in a couple of riders from the EF team. It's my understanding that Clara Honsinger at the moment does not have a contract and is not in a position to sign a contract with the new EF Education women's team, which leaves us with a question. Does she have support this season or what's going on? Because I would say that there surely should be one team wanting to sign Honsinger because on the courses that suit her, she is still very much a top five World Cup rider. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit crazy, to be honest, that someone of that caliber has to, you know, that still doesn't really have a team or at least from from what we know, we we haven't really picked up on anything, to be honest. Um, yeah, it is a bit, a bit of a bad situation, to be honest, because I don't think that it would be great for your preparation. The uncertainty, obviously, that, that, that goes with it as well, because... You know, obviously, you need to you need to have some sort of support for the winter. I don't really understand it. I mean, I, obviously, I can understand it from from AF's point of view, what they are doing, and obviously, they wanna they wanna make make a step forward in, in that direction. And you could argue maybe that Onsinger maybe might not really fit in that, but still, there is you know. <laughs> there should be one team at least that that has some interest and, and and wants to pick it up but yeah it's the timing is a bit it's it's not great to say the least it's um you know the season is almost starting most of the teams already you know went through their budget and everything is said and done and then you know there some might not even have the room to um to 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 sign her in a way so it's tricky. It's very tricky, and I hope that she can find a team that can help her out uh, for the winter. You know, it doesn't need to be now. Uh, it's not going to be ideal, obviously, but still, if you at least have some sort of support for the winter, that that would obviously be great. But it's um, it's definitely not going to be easy. Or just a privateer sponsor, but she deserves something. Anyway, let's talk about the riders who are here. Top favorite normally would be Magali Rochette. Two seasons ago, 2021-22, she had that amazing season. Last year had COVID and some other sickness in the season prep. Ruined her season, basically, although she recovered decently towards the end. Podium in Valdisol. It's my understanding that she had some issues again this year in the season prep, but they are not as bad as last year. Hoping to build into the season. I would say that her main rivals if her form is not great would be Caroline Mani who won a bunch of races last year the Pan American champion Raylin Nuss and Sydney McGill racing for the new Cervelo Orange team which is a newly funded U23 team with on that team as well Jules van Kempen and Kaya Musgrave the junior women's national champion of last year so what do you think, Isam? Can we make a reasonable guess about the form of Rochette and conclude that she or one of the other favorites is going to win the race, or is it just too hard to tell at the moment? Yeah, that's that's going to be uh, that's going to be something uh, to look forward to. I mean, it's I don't know. Rochette sometimes has said that the form was not really there, and then in the race it was going okay. Obviously start of last season wasn't that great uh but that had their reasons uh so i i I don't know i think that if if rochette is on a reasonable level she's definitely in my opinion going to be the the main favorite but 
you know, if that is not the case and she's not going to be at her best and, and, and not on a level that she could compete for the win, I think, you know, last year it was kind of the, the Caroline Mani show. You know, the age should definitely, <laughs> normally it should kind of count. Uh, so it's going to be probably a bit more difficult for her to do the same that she did last season. But if she is able to to match that, it's definitely possible for her to um, to again bring bring the series to to her hand. But I think with Nas, she definitely has someone that, on a good day, could could potentially you know bring bring a battle. And if Mani is not able to to reach the level that she reached last year, you know then it's going to be um, I think a little bit more interesting in that regard. I would probably give Rochette the benefit of the doubt. I mean, last year she improved towards Falmouth, and if this year is not as bad as last year, she should be able to do well. Considering the trend of last season, I would also expect Raylin Nuss and Carolyn Mani to have roughly the same level. Last year, Nuss improved throughout the USCX series and kept coming closer and closer to Mani. But I'm super curious to see what Sydney McGill can do. As said, she's on the Cervelo team now. She ended in the top 10 of the World Cups of Dublin and Valdisol last year. Sure, not the most stacked ones, but they are pretty good. So I think she can maybe compete for a podium based on the progression she's made. And then finally, we have to mention the fact that Austin Killips is not allowed to race, as far as I'm aware. The UCI has adapted new legislation which bans transgender athletes from participating in the women's race under cer certain circumstances. I believe that Killips therefore is not allowed to race this season. That means that the riders who were behind her last season, Lizzie Gonzalez and Lauren Zorner, both riders who were just 19 last year, they're going to be 20 this season, move up these should be riders that we see just off the podium especially factoring in that Anna-Marie Worst as far as I'm aware is not making the trip to the US this season to do the racing. Then I think we should move on to after the USCX series because we have a race in Indianapolis. I think it's a bit of a shame that the USCX series doesn't stop a week before Waterloo but we discussed that before. So in Indianapolis we have Zoe Baxter at the start. And I think it's interesting that she's coming here. She made the move from EF Education to Canyon Tram with immediate effect. And now she's racing in Indianapolis. So I think that normally, especially just comparing it to the US level, Backstead, top 10 rider in the world already, despite just being a second year U23, should be able to pretty comfortably win that race. Yeah normally that that should be that should be the case but obviously i don't know when she will arrive there in, in, in the states and and how everything will go there but if everything goes well Buxted should normally be the main favorite and, and win that race uh, quite comfortably but uh, it's interesting to see that um, they will be arriving a week earlier i don't know if that was because of you know the fact that the world cup is is you know moved a week later or something but i guess probably that was that was planned and that was you know it's sponsor reasons sram american yeah big market there for them i think they pulled out blevins in the past i mean it's not the first time they it's it's just for sponsor reasons that they need to get their big star rider out yeah that explains it i, I would say so but I think it's it's going to be interesting as well uh, how she does it. Uh, normally, it should just be a, an easy win in a way. But I think we can still take some notes from from that race and and see how she uh, she handles it. Baxter will be facing opposition from another Dutch rider currently down to do the race, Mandon Bakker. And if I were Bakker, I would seriously try and win that World Cup in Waterloo because holy shit, that jersey is ugly. <laughs> It it just feels like overly rushed at the, the beginning of the week. They were like, no way. Oh, the team presentation is this week. We don't have a jersey. And Corendon is a new sponsor. What can we do? And then the designer was like, ah, I have a ketchup bottle here. I have last year's jersey. Ah, ketchup bottle is almost empty. Hmm. Let's just spray a bit of that ketchup on the jersey. Call it a day. Add the Corendon logo on. Send it. Ah, they accepted it. Nice. Easy, easy win. But holy shit. I, this is... This is a terribly looking kit. 
<laughs> it's terrible. It's honestly, it's it's like you know, the least amount of inspiration has been put in in on that jersey. It is. Um, I'm not looking forward to see that on my screen, honestly, because it was. Uh, just looking at it and the pictures that they shared with us, it was uh, quite terrible. Uh, but that is sometimes how it goes. I don't know how, how much time went into all this. It, it seemed a little rushed, in my opinion, but I don't know how, how, how everything went. But the jersey itself definitely could have gotten a little bit more attention. Um, but I guess, you know, for the riders, it's it, it might be a very good deal you have now. In the likes of Corendom, definitely someone that uh, that has some money behind it, um, and you know that can obviously bring some stability to the team. Not that there was a lack of it, but it's just a little bit more secure now, I guess. And um, yeah, I think overall, in that regard, it's definitely good for the team. But the jersey is is really awful, and um, if it was for the jersey alone, I wouldn't have wanted to see them change anything. Uh, but I guess we have to deal with it now. I mean, some people might like it. It's it's taste Im- impossible, uh... <laughs> impossible. <laughs> I mean, who knows? It's um, it's it's taste, and everybody is free to have their own opinion in that regard. After Indianapolis, we go to Waterloo. As always, Boas Trek Lions will bring out a couple of their riders. We're seeing Fleur Morse starting. She is making the move from Paul Souza to the team then currently registered as well for the race two days before the World Cup, the Trek CX Cup, David Haverdings, Lars van der Haar, Pim Ronhaar, Joris Nieuwenhuis. I also expect Thibaut Nijs to be starting the race based on an interview he gave. I do not know about Shirin van Androy. I would assume she is going to be taking some rest after a long, heavy road season. Won the Tour de l'Avenir for women. She is going to race the European Championships. And Van Empel is also going to be doing that. I don't know if Van Empel is coming. Van Empel won a stage in the Tour de l'Avenir for women. So obviously her form is still pretty good. I'm honestly pretty worried how many riders will come. I hope Iserbeet comes. I hope Van Turenhout comes. I hope Sve comes. But at the moment I have no indication to say anything about it. I think we'll talk about it more extensively in our World Cup preview when we'll preview the World Cup calendar and just everything in general around the World Cup. But yeah, definitely, I'm, I'm just hoping that there will be a decent turnout and it won't just be Americans and Boas Trek and a handful of riders who go by themselves like Bakker or Baxet who's supported by our team. A couple of riders who I do expect to be there. Maddie Monroe was pretty good in the USCX series races she did last year. She will come later this year. I mean, I would guess she's doing Waterloo because of the Trek connection. And she will still be racing the two remaining World Cup mountain bikes, which are held the two weeks before Waterloo. So I think she should be there. And that brings me to the final rider I would like to have your opinion on. Or it's actually two twin sisters. Isabella and Eva Holmgren. Both of them are making a transfer to Lidl Trek. Exciting times. I mean, positive, I would say. I think that it is, um, you know, definitely a, a, a strong bike manufacturer that you have behind you. A uh, bike manufacturer that can support you in all disciplines. Something that they, you know, they still want to do. Uh, I think that they will get a lot of freedom and, you know, it will definitely for them be... I think it will be a, a good environment in a way. It's a professional environment. Uh, they can definitely offer that. And um, I think, you you know, there is there is a lot of possibilities that they can uh, that they can go through. So I would, I would say almost the perfect fit. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting how that, that will work. Uh, and and how they will benefit from it, but I'm I'm almost certain that they will benefit from uh, from that signing, and um, you know it's very good that they are in good hands right now. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Sam. I think it's a perfect match with Trek, the multidisciplinary approach. Wonder what jersey they will be racing in this cross season. Trek have a couple of options. Their factory team, the Balas Trek team, currently not on the roster though. Or else maybe even the CX Harris team that's supported by Trek. So I'm interested to see which direction this will take. But it should be good. Cross is coming. It's going to be on our screens. I'm going to Mechelen. It's going to be right in front of me. 
I'm excited to watch the video today of 25 minutes, Curtis White, the For the Love of Cross. We'll link it in the description for the people interested. It was a pretty good watch, to be honest. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Final thing to mention, news on Puck Peterson, second in Leggett this weekend, finishing the World Cup, going to win the overall. I don't know if she will be moving from the final World Cup directly to Waterloo or in what form she will be, what tiredness situation she will have, but... That's something to keep in mind. I'm super excited. Isam, thank you so much for being here. Cross is here. Already more excited than I was before. So I guess uh, it's already starting to, to come up. So uh, yeah, but thank you for having me. We will be back on Tuesday. Podcast for USCX series coming out on Tuesdays due to the late hour of racing for us. They only finish at 11 hour time. So by the time this would be edited, recorded, it would be... 3 a.m., 2 a.m., our time, way too late. Need to think about the sleep, need to stay fit for uni and everything else. Final year of The Bachelor, make or break, so need to stay fit. But we will be bringing podcasts for all the USCX series this season. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening or whatever. And we will see you guys on Tuesday. Goodbye.